Спокойствием встретить все, что принесет наступающий день. Воля твоя будет, Господи, всюду, везде и во всем, и доставит да сомнения тень. Не дай забыть, что все не спослано тобою. Good morning to our study today. I'm Judith Irene Mata, your host and producer of the program, Holy Scriptures and You. Our world around us is becoming pagan in almost a worse sense because we've many times received the gospel, we've pushed it away and turned to a new age paganism which is much more dangerous than not having received the gospel at all. This turns many of us in America and Europe into heretics because heresy is a choice. And when you're a pagan, you haven't had a choice of the gospel. When you've been Christian, you've had the choice of either accepting, living by it, and then you may choose against it. God honors our free will. He doesn't ensnare us. He doesn't trap us. He's, he's all love in, a, in a, such a pure and holy, constant love we can't imagine it. Unconditional is the best way to describe His love for us. But in that unconditional love, He allows us, He trusts us with free will, which is the image of God in us, part of it, and uh, in allowing this, we sometimes make very serious mistakes. We sometimes choose selfishly for our self against Him and His holy commands. God is not onerous. He gives us wonderful commands, life-giving commands. It's like getting water when you're a young plant. You need it. So we are watered by the commandments of God. Забыть, что все не спослано тобою. Не дай забыть. The fact that the body means nothing in the pagan world, and Gnostic is a part of the paganism. So, in the early Greek pagans, the body was a throwaway. It was an envelope, as it were, or a glove, which held the real person, which is the soul. In Gnostic philosophy, the soul was understood to be the person. Now, as we know in Christianity, we pick up from the Jewish, the Hebrew uh, old Israel, which understood correctly that man is only really man in two parts. He is body in symphonia, or in conjunction, with the soul. It takes both soul and body to be called a human being. They both have to be present at death. As St. Basil says, and so many of them, they are separated, so they cannot be called the human being. They are part of themselves. At the final resurrection, of course, Christ will resurrect the body to be with each soul either in glory or in shame, according to what was done in that body by the soul. The body is a servant of the soul. That's why we have to, as it were, prune the body's passions. We prune the uh, by ascetical fasting in the proper sense, not punishing, but just trimming back and re-channeling the body's passions so that anger is channeled into zeal for the Lord, for instance. That lust is channeled into love for our only God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, heresy is not just a bad idea. It's a choice of self-destruction. Because if we choose philosophy and an intellectual approach to the Holy Scriptures, for instance, or to prayer life, we will miss 
the presence of God and we will miss his way for us as he answers that prayer. I'll be using Saint Irenaeus, the church father who's so wonderful and whose icon is here on my right. His book Against Heresies is exposing the first problem really that came into the church, Gnosticism, which means knowledge falsely so called by Saint Paul referenced in his, his first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verse 20, at the very end. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to thy care. Turn away from profane and vain utterances. The oppositions of that system, falsely named knowledge, quote unquote, which some profess, and they have missed the mark concerning the faith. Let's go to our fathers. The Apostle is speaking about those who were called Gnostics, says the commentator, who filled up every uncleanness. He calls them idle and vain speakers. Of these heresies, Nicholas, who was one of the seven deacons, was one of the first. He is referenced in the book of Revelation, in which his followers are called Nicolaitans. Вечных путях неизменных законов творения всего. Say, what are these uh, Gnostic heresies? What do they do? It's a system of pagan understanding of in those days, in the first century after Christ, was called science. Science was the knowledge of how to placate various gods, and we would call them demons, fallen angels and you would ascend a hierarchy uh, of that in your thoughts, in your rituals, defeating this one, defeating that one, and then coming into uh, being equal with God. So St. Irenaeus, against heresies, you will want to read, if you want to understand the early uh, form of this, it's very complex, because you had very great philosophers thinking they could go into this and, and defeat God and have the gifts of the Spirit without the Holy Spirit. So you have uh, Irenaeus going through this intricate system, not by his own mind, but by the All Holy Spirit. So let's examine this early heresy as it is in our own time and place. We always pray in our divine services for right-believing bishops. There are many who are not right-believing, and as our world gets closer to chaos of the Antichrist, we more and more are falling in to the idea that we all have to get along with other false religions. They have evidently not experienced Christ and His saving power, which is really only fully found in the orthodox teachings and the scripture that is given to us by the First Council of Nicaea in 325. That's when the Holy Fathers discerned what the books of scripture would be. They had the Hebrew scriptures, as they were called, for old Israel, and now they had to discern by the Holy Spirit's grace among them what books would be used as true gospels from the eyewitnesses to Christ's life, passion, and resurrection, and uh, the epistles by the vessel of election, as he is called, St. Paul, and St. Peter, St. Jude, the other apostles who wrote, St. John the theologian, of course, his own epistles, called the beloved of God, gives us a wonderful insight through his later gospel meant to correct the Gnostics already appearing 
uh, from Simon the Magician and from Nicholas, the false deacon. It was already uh, infiltrating the churches with this false system. They would say the creed, and yet in their own mind they would think, hmm, that's a lesser God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, that's a lesser God. And then they would be making up all these definitions, even as they said, the creed along with everyone else who properly understood it and were baptized into it. To, let's get to the root of how this teaching started, a continuation of the Pharisees who loved the law instead of their relationship with the Lord who is life-giving and all-loving. Many of you, as you first come in to the uh, Orthodox faith, you will visit a parish, as I did, several. And you will hear this strange thing. We have to confess the most minute details to the super guru priest, who is like a New Age guru in this case. And he will be able to forgive me of all my little minute sins. Why is this necessary? Because if I die, and when I die, I will, in their false system, have to go through a gauntlet of demonic questioners who will question me, did you do that, did you do that, before I can get into the presence of Christ. Now, may I remind you again of the scripture we began with, 1 Corinthians, in which Paul says, do you not know you will judge these fallen angels? May I remind these false gurus who want to exalt themselves as spiritual fathers that St. Paul's words depose you. They strip away any kind of pretense that you may be uh, acting in. And all we have to do is go to St. Irenaeus here in Against Heresies you will be exposed again by the Holy Father, St. Irenaeus, given to us, Father James in our parish, especially in a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. In fact, he exposes this as a false purgatory. So what we need to do when you come into an Orthodox church, a parish that's teaching this, you turn around and say, this is not Orthodoxy. It is Gnosticism, it's a false religion. So, if you hear the teacher Seraphim Rose, he will be called Father Seraphim Rose. He began his own monastery outside the traditions of our holy faith. A monastery is founded by an elder who is very holy and close to the Lord Jesus Christ. This man decided, as a convert, he would found his own monastery. He hides behind a bishop that was near him in San Francisco, John Maximovich. I'm naming names, I have to. If we don't name names, we will not know when you come into a parish that Father Rose, so-called, is not an Orthodox teacher. He has been defrocked in spirit by the Holy Spirit who rises up and says, get rid of this teaching. It's a blasphemy to God. What does he teach? He teaches that after death, we have to go through the same gauntlet that was exposed by St. Irenaeus as false, as, as pagan. If we are in Christ, and since we are in Christ, every Christian knows from the teaching of St. Paul and all the other saints, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He has overcome Hades. He has overcome and routed Satan. He has overcome death itself and will finally overcome death, 
as he comes the second time uh, in the flesh, in his glorified flesh, putting death under his feet. In the meantime, you and I put the fear of death. I put all these things aside. I trample on them. Uh, I have zeal for the house of the Lord. And I say, teach the Holy Scriptures. We don't have spiritual elders. We have fakes and phonies for the most part. We have a man called Ephraim that is starting monasteries under the uh, guise of Greek Orthodox. All of these people have money. It's the devil's money. Don't you understand? If you're in the world and you're teaching a blasphemy, the devil will give you uh, a lot of abundance so that you could spread this false teaching of his. Seraphim Rose and his minions published many, many hundreds of thousands of books. They were translated into Russian. They made their way secretly as secret knowledge into the uh, Latinized Russian church. The Russian church had already been co-opted by the Catholics Peter. under the Tsar, Peter. So they already had a tendency to the Latinized understanding of punishment instead of repentance, for instance, uh, of a super pietism necessary, a super asceticism. So what do we have? We have a ready-made uh, ground for this Gnostic teaching, this neo-Gnostic, since it's new in a, diff in a different guise, a new age guise, we have the same uh, teaching, this blasphemy, that we must go through punishments, uh, being judged by fallen liars, fallen angels, whom Christ called uh, has the nature of lying, the Lord himself says, as he's correcting the Pharisees. You are of your father, Satan, because you are liars, and he is the father of lies. I've seen so many people, first of all, goodwill, good-hearted Protestants who know the scripture, turned away by this phantasm, by this uh, ghoulish understanding that after death I have to go through all these punishments by demons of all things. Uh, we cast out demons. We will judge demons at the end of the ages, as St. Paul himself says. All of scripture defeats this kind of teeth. We have the purgatory idea of the Latins, uh, f finding a home again among orthodoxy. It was bad enough during Tsar Peter. Now they find a more intricate form of purgatory, I think even worse, because we're not being judged by God, we're being judged by demons of all things, fallen angels. <laughs> Now here are some things to watch for. The tale of Basil the New. This is a, a dream, a fantasy of a Gnostic believer in which he takes up the identity of this Basil and by Basil's prayers this really bad woman is delivered of her sins as she has to pay at each toll house uh, with Basil's good works. This is right out of the Latin theology, the Roman Catholic theology, of the reservoir of the good deeds of the saints, which are drawn upon when I do indulgences. When I say 500 rosaries, I have an indulgence that will get me out of purgatory. This is the same thing under different, more orthodox sounding teachings. Actually, they are sheer Gnostic teachings. As you may know, Metropolitan Philip, the Antiochian Metropolitan, came against this theology. And in his, uh, his letter warning people against this teaching, Metropolitan Philip uh, refers to this work, uh, The Heresy of the Toll Houses, 
the Theotokos and the Heresy of the Toll Houses by Adnan Trabulsi, who is, has his doctorate, and this was, I believe, part of his doctoral thesis. It is very good. We also have built up among Russians and Serbs various customs. And sometimes we begin to think that they're sacred tradition and not merely ordinary traditions or customs that have been around for a long time. And sometimes those things can obscure or cloud our vision when we're looking toward the gospel and looking toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Recently, someone whose relative had died told me that they were told by someone in authority that after a person dies, the soul begins to wander for three days in different places. And then after the third day, it goes to heaven to worship at the throne of God until the ninth day. Then it goes to hell to see the torments of the damned. And there are various variations on this story. But in fact, this story came to us from the pagan Egyptian Book of the Dead. Because it was believed that in the embalming period, until the entrails and brain were taken out of the body for embalming, the soul would hover above the body or visit places that it loved. It would take uh, another 10 or so days to get the organs packed into the canopic jars where they were stored beneath the mummy. And for an ordinary person, the embalming period took about 40 days. <coughs> so I would like to explain about this tradition and why it's not a tradition and why it should be stamped out. First of all, St. John Chrysostom says, it's totally impossible for a soul, once it leaves the body, to remain here or to wander here, but it goes directly in the company of the angels to its place of repose until the resurrection. But what do the Holy Fathers teach us about the third, ninth, and fortieth day services? Every culture, every civilization, has a series of stepping away from grief rituals for when somebody departs this life. And those who are grieving for them follow these stepping away from grief rituals so they can pull their life back together and get on with their lives. On the 40th day, the Holy Fathers tell us, we celebrate the Memorial Day because on that day, our Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven both body and soul together, teaching us that on the resurrection we also will ascend body and soul together into eternity, not the one without the other, because man does not consist only of a soul like a disembodied ghost, but also of a body which was created by God and which God said was very good. So we proclaim the resurrection and the victory of Jesus Christ when we serve the third, ninth, and fortieth day services. And this helps us to step away from our grief and to look forward to eternity, to the resurrection, to the reun when we will all be reunited again. So this is the joyous and illumining and radiant teaching of the church. And yet so many people confusing custom with tradition have given us something dark and ugly and evil in place of the joyous teaching and the true tradition of the church, the sacred tradition and the words of the Holy Fathers. All of these things detract us from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, from the glorious message of his victory over Satan, his victory over the dark powers of this world. It's why at the Lord's Prayer we do not say deliver us from evil, but deliver us from the evil one, because our Lord Jesus Christ has delivered us from all these powers of darkness.
for what's ugly and distorted and twisted and dark cannot come from Jesus Christ and it could not have come from the holy apostles. Some of these customs or false traditions such as the mitashto or so-called aerial toll houses. These things are from Satan. They come to us from Egyptian mythology and from Gnosticism. They do not come to us from the tradition of the church. They do not come to us from the sacred tradition of the church. But they're traditions of men borrowed from dark sources which have infiltrated or come into the church through the workings of, of the devil. So when we have or see or remember these sort of dark customs and traditions, these things that make the devil look more powerful than Jesus Christ, we know they cannot come from the gospel, they cannot come from any true source, but from a well polluted with toxins and poisons. So if we are fully given over to Christ Jesus, we are fully baptized by three immersions into the waters of baptism. We are anointed as part of that baptism, entering into the holy faith. As part of that baptism, we'll deny Satan and all of his pomps. I turn against him, I even spit toward him, put under my feet. Remember, we are to judge angels. We pray to be, O Lord, at thy right hand of glory. And we pray this, knowing that you are our only Savior and Lord. We glorify thee in the Father, through the Son, and in the power and cleansing of the All-Holy Spirit. Amen. Мое просвети для того, чтобы я правильно могла послужить вечных путей.